from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Here we're here today to listen to Christy Miller talk about her book, Ellen and Edith, President Wilson's Two First Ladies. Her book has been called eye-opening, compelling, and deeply researched by critics and scholars. It tells the story of two very different women who helped shape and recast one of the country's most historically significant presidencies, that of Woodrow Wilson. Wilson's first wife, Ellen, was his rock. She encouraged him, kept his house, schooled his children, digested his readings, and even translated his books. Without her, Wilson probably never would have become president. Then, just 15 months into his first term, which began in 1913, she died. Wilson was lost and disconsolate until he met a wonderful woman, a widow named Edith. They married, and she helped hold the White House together after her suffer husband suffered a debilitating stroke that left him largely incapacitated. She held that back. In fact, her death, or not his, her death, I'm sorry, his stroke and their reaction to the stroke would later spur, help spur, the advent of the 25th Amendment and what you do when a president's incapacitated. Anyway, I'm eager to hear how Christy came up with this idea and executed it so well. She's a research associate at Southwest Center of the University of Arizona and the author of Isabel Greenway, An Enterprising Woman. An interesting factoid, she's one of the few people I've ever met who's taught English on four continents. She'll be signing her book at 4.30 p.m. And we're all excited, and let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Dell. It's wonderful to be here. It's very heartening for a writer to see so many readers together in one place. Of course, writers are first and foremost readers, too. And when I started this project, amazingly enough, I completely forgot the first rule of being a good reader. Never judge a book by its cover. I had seen pictures of Woodrow Wilson, and I came to the conclusion that he was cerebral and cool, that he was a stern schoolmaster, that he was a prim Presbyterian. I knew very little about his first wife, Ellen Axon Wilson, and so I decided that she couldn't possibly have been either interesting or important. I'd never even heard about Mary Allen Holbert Peck, Woodrow Wilson's intimate friend for eight years. I'd heard about Edith Bowling Galt Wilson, and everything I'd heard was bad, that she was a power-hungry woman who seized power when Woodrow Wilson had a stroke, that she was a secret woman president. Fortunately, I live right here in Washington, D.C., and just up the hill behind us is the Library of Congress, the sponsor of this great event. And it is a temple of learning and a fabulous resource for researchers. So I started reading Woodrow Wilson's letters to Ellen Axon. In, 19, in 1883, just after they became engaged. They had a two-year engagement and wrote each other hundreds of letters. And what I discovered when I was reading these letters is, yes, he was very cerebral, but he was far from cool. He was very romantic and passionate. Soon after their engagement, he wrote her, I am not a boy any longer. It was left for you to teach me the vast, immeasurable difference between a youth's fancy and a man's overmastering love. I am sometimes absolutely frightened at the intensity of my love for you. 
Two years later, just before their marriage, he wrote her, asking her to imagine the warmest of kisses pressed down upon the sweetest center of your lips. Woodrow was not just romantic, however. He was unusually dependent on women for the fulfillment of his own powers. He could not work unless he was assured that a woman he loved, loved him also. Fortunately, Ellen was the perfect partner for Woodrow Wilson. She loved him very much, and she told him so eloquently. She was a very unusual woman for her time and place. She grew up after the Civil War in a small town in Georgia, but she was unusually well-educated. Her father was a Presbyterian minister, and Ellen was an avid reader. It was said she could find an apt quotation for any occasion. She also had abundant artistic talent. Her work had won a prize at an exposition in Paris. And by the time she was 23, she had concluded that she was never going to find a man who could live up to her ideals. She decided that she and her friends would open a women's boarding house, and she would support it with her artwork. People began to call her Ellie the Man-Hater. And then she met Woodrow Wilson. They fell in love, and they got married. Ellen was not only a loving wife, she was a capable helpmate. She, Woodrow Wilson was a brilliant man, but he may have suffered from a learning disorder. He was almost 12 before he learned how to read. He had great difficulty in learning foreign languages, so Ellen learned German in order to translate the political monographs that he needed for his research. She also made digests of political science books in English for him. With her help, he achieved the first of his ambitions, which was to be a professor at his alma mater in Princeton University. Once he became a professor at Princeton, he was a very popular professor. He began to be invited to make speeches, and she helped him a great deal with his speeches as well, providing those apt quotations when he needed them. He was invited to give a very important speech for the 150th anniversary of the founding of Princeton. And they collaborated closely on that speech. We found manuscripts with corrections in both of their handwritings. And at one point she said, the ending is a little flat. You need to make it sore. You should read a poem by John Milton. She told him which poem to read. If you compare that poem to the speech, you can see that's just exactly what he did. The speech is full of metaphors that obviously came from her experience about art and domestic affairs. The speech was a huge success. And it was clear that Woodrow Wilson was destined for greater things. Now, Ellen loved being a professor's wife. For her, that was the pinnacle of happiness. But she knew that Woodrow had more ambition. In fact, that's partly what had drawn her to him. She once said, I can be a better wife to a great man than a small one. So when Woodrow Wilson was elected president of Princeton College, she went along. She moved her house. She began to entertain. She had to entertain former President Theodore Roosevelt and the great African-American educator Booker T. Washington. This last rather scandalized the Georgia ants. And Woodrow Wilson was, again, very successful. He was so successful that he began to think of a career in public service, which is what he had really always wanted. And he began to be discussed for governor of New Jersey. But in 1906, with this rosy prospect ahead of them, 
a tragedy befell the Wilsons. Woodrow Wilson woke up one morning in May blind in his left eye. He'd probably had a mini stroke. He was 49 years old. And he was devastated. The doctors told him that he might have to give up his career entirely. There was no medication for hypertension in those days. They told him, however, that he could recover if he just took regular vacations. So in January of 1907, he went to Bermuda for a month. Ellen was planning to go with him, but she didn't because at the last moment she had a family emergency. He went, and two days before he was due to come home, he met a fascinating woman, Mary Allen Hulbert Peck. She was the leading social hostess of the island. She entertained the governor general. She entertained Mark Twain. And when Woodrow got back to Princeton, he started to write to her. This was not unusual. Ellen had always encouraged him to have friendships with other women. Those pictures notwithstanding, Woodrow Wilson had a very silly side to him. He loved to sing and dance and tell jokes and recite limericks. Ellen was a much more serious person, and she couldn't keep up with that side of him. She wanted him to have cheerful female companions. But this time, she sensed that something was different about Mary Peck. So when Woodrow Wilson went to Bermuda in January of 1908, and once again, Ellen was prevented from going by a family situation, she issued an injunction to him to watch himself with Mary. And it was no use. There on that tropical island with all the sea breezes wafting across his skin, he became completely infatuated with Mary Peck. There is a scrap of handwriting on a slip of paper that says, my precious one, my beloved Mary. When he got back to Princeton that spring, Ellen was furious. She accused him of emotional love for Mary. He went on vacation to England that summer, and Ellen went to an artist colony in Connecticut. She had given up her artwork in order to devote herself to Woodrow. Now she took it up again to have some part of her life that was not entwined with his. All that summer, he wrote her pleading letters, begging to be forgiven. We don't know what she wrote because all of her letters are missing. We think that she probably burned them. But at the end of the summer, Woodrow write, wrote her a very happy letter. Obviously, she'd forgiven him. And he said, it's even better to be loved if you don't deserve it. So. Wouldn't you think that he would stop seeing Mary Peck? No, he didn't. In fact, as soon as he got back to the United States, he and Ellen went up to Massachusetts, where Mary lived with her husband during the summer. I don't know why she did that. It could be that she wanted to see this rival. It could be that she wanted Mary to see her and to know that she had the better claim on him. It could be that she wanted to protect Woodrow Wilson's reputation because he had a political career ahead of him. So she pretended that Mary Peck was a family friend. Sure enough, in 1910, Woodrow Wilson was elected governor of New Jersey. Once again, Ellen rose to the occasion. She'd been active in welfare work in her community. This was known as municipal housekeeping. Women argued that if they could run households, they could also clean up their communities. This was considered a safe alternative to the scary idea of women voting. So she began to investigate the state institutions and she made a tour of many of them. This was a, a really groundbreaking move on her part. Woodrow kind of tagged along on that tour. 
Woodrow's administration was such a success that he began to be spoken of as a potential presidential candidate. Ellen recognized that there was a big obstacle to his running for president. William Jennings Bryan, who had three times been the Democratic nominee for president and whom Woodrow had insulted publicly several years before. So Ellen arranged for Woodrow to have dinner with Bryan, very intimate dinner. And sure enough, Woodrow found he liked Bryan, and they spoke from the same platform after that. And she did, as she had done before, continued to see Mary Peck as a family friend. Woodrow began to travel around the country making speeches. Ellen followed his progress very closely, sending him telegrams of commentary. At one point, she sent him a telegram and said, stop saying you're not running for president. It just makes you look foolish. He stopped. Sure enough, he became the Democratic nominee in June of 1912 partly with the help of Bryant. That summer, when the Republicans held their convention, William Howard Taft, the incumbent, was opposed by former President Theodore Roosevelt. Taft won, and Roosevelt was so bitter over that loss that he formed a third party, the Progressive or Bull Moose Party. And he was really seen as the bigger competitor to Wilson. He was so popular. So one of Roosevelt's advisors came up to him and he said, we've managed to obtain some letters of Woodrow Wilson's to Mary Peck. You should publish them and this campaign will be over. You will win. And Roosevelt said, no, that would be wrong. Also, he said, nobody would believe me. Who's going to think the man is a Romeo? He looks like he ought to be working in a drugstore. <laughs> so he did not publish the letters, and Woodrow Wilson won. So in the beginning of 1913, Ellen found herself in the White House. It was not a place she ever wanted to be, but once she was there, she felt she had to use it for its maximum benefit she began to be interested in what we would now call urban renewal. Up here behind the Capitol were a maze of little alleyways. They were narrow and dark and dirty. They bred crime and disease. They were full of dilapidated little houses. At that time, the federal government was running the district and she wanted federal legislation to tear down those houses and build modern, hygienic, new houses at low cost for the residents. She got a White House car, and she began to take members of Congress around those alleys to show them the squalor that existed right behind the marble halls of the Capitol building. As far as I know, she was the first First Lady to lobby outside of the White House for a cause that was not on her husband's agenda. But in the second year of Woodrow Wilson's term, her health began to decline. And by June of 1914, she could no longer get out of bed. Her doctor was in denial. He thought she was suffering from nerves. Woodrow was distracted because at the end of June, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria had been assassinated and the international situation was going to pieces. But by August 6th, it was clear that Ellen was dying. This was two days after all the European powers had declared war on each other. Ellen knew she was running out of time, so she made two final requests. The first was to her husband's chief of staff. She asked him, please, to go up to Capitol Hill and tell the congressman she would die more easily if they would just pass that alley legislation. The Senate took action right away in time for her to receive word before she lost consciousness. 
The bill was eventually passed, but it was never implemented. With the onset of World War I, they needed all the buildings they could have, dilapidated or not, and in any case, they had more important things to think about. Ellen's second request was to the White House physician. She said, doctor, please take care of my husband. And then she died. Woodrow was disconsolate. He wandered the halls of the White House, empty, echoing. He told one correspondent that he was reading detective stories as a man might get drunk just to forget. You might have thought he would have turned to Mary at this time, but due to the pressures of the presidency, their relationship really had cooled. And in any case, that would have confirmed the rumors about them. So he was alone. By the spring of 1915, the doctor became worried. After all, his patient was the president and the world was at war. So he introduced a friend of his, Edith Bowling Galt, to the president. Mrs. Galt was a widow. She was the proprietor of Galt Jewelers, which we old timers in Washington remember fondly. It was known as the Tiffany's of Washington. She was 15 years younger than Woodrow. She was vivacious, cheerful, flirtatious. The first night she came to dine at the White House in a long black velvet gown, Woodrow Wilson's Secret Service man said to his valet, oh, she's a looker. And the valet said, yeah, he's a goner. <laughs> and he was. He proposed marriage to her just two months after they met. She refused. She said they hadn't known each other long enough, and in any case, it hadn't been a year, the minimum amount of time before a remarriage. Woodrow didn't give up. In July, he invited Edith to vacation with him and his three grown daughters in New Hampshire, and he proposed again. This time, she accepted. But they kept the engagement secret because it still had not been a year since Ellen's death. There was another wrinkle to this romantic saga, and that was Mary. Woodrow confessed to Edith he called his relationship with Mary a folly long ago loathed and repented of. She forgave him, but she made sure it was over. They announced their engagement in October of 1915. Even before they got married, Woodrow took her into his confidence. He wanted her to share every aspect of his work with him. He showed her secret State Department documents. He annotated them for her better understanding. And she loved that. She liked to say, I love the way you put one dear hand on mine while with the other you turn the pages of history. They got married at the end of December 1915. 1916 was a presidential election year and Woodrow was running for re-election. Edith campaigned with him. She was a big asset to his campaign because she warmed up his austere image. In November, Woodrow Wilson was narrowly re-elected. They were using the slogan, he kept us out of the war. But shortly after his inauguration, the Germans resumed unrestricted submarine warfare, and the United States was drawn into World War I. Edith's role changed almost completely. She volunteered in a Red Cross canteen, handing out coffee and sandwiches to the soldiers as they came through Union Station. What she really liked was anything to do with Woodrow. She named battleships. When he had to sign commissions for new officers in the army, she made a little game of it, whisking away one paper and putting another one down in front of him, trying to see how many they could do in an hour. She even decoded the telegrams coming from Europe. 
Arguably, her most important job was keeping the president healthy. Every day, she would drag him out to play golf. They were both terrible golfers, but they enjoyed it a lot. On November 11, 1918, the war ended. And Woodrow made the surprising decision to go to Europe himself to negotiate the peace treaty. He was the first sitting president to go to Europe, and of course she was the first presiding first lady to go to Europe. They were greeted like heroes. They were met by throngs of people throwing flowers and cheering them. They stayed at Buckingham Palace. Edith wrote home, it was like a Cinderella existence. But once the negotiations began, things got tough, and Woodrow's health began to suffer. Finally, in June of that year, the Treaty of Versailles was signed. It provided for a League of Nations, an international body that would mediate disputes and hopefully prevent war in the future. But when Woodrow brought the treaty back to the United States to be ratified by the Senate, the Senate refused. They were jealous of their constitutional prerogative to declare war, and they were afraid the League of Nations would oblige them when they didn't want to. They wanted to add amendments or reservations, and Woodrow wanted the document ratified as written. So he undertook a speaking tour by train all across the United States to California and back. It was September. It was hot. Of course, there was no air conditioning in these metal cars. He was speaking every day, sometimes more than once. As they returned from California and wound up through the Rocky Mountains, the altitude began to tell on his blood pressure. In Pueblo, Colorado, he collapsed. They raced back to Washington, but it was too late. A few days after they arrived, he suffered a massive stroke. He was paralyzed. He could hardly speak. Nobody knew what his mental faculties were like, and as president, he was completely incapacitated. Edith made the decision to carry on. She did what no other first lady has done before or since. She instructed the White House staff and his doctors to keep his condition a secret. And she was the one who decided what should happen next. The next 18 months, the rest of his term, she later characterized as her stewardship. She decided who could see Woodrow Wilson. She decided what issues would be brought before him. Mostly, she just deferred things. She wanted to wait until he should recover. She was implored to take more action for the sake of the country. And she said, I'm not thinking about the country. I'm thinking about my husband. Some people say that if she had allowed Woodrow Wilson more access to his advisors, that they would have changed his mind and gotten him to compromise on the League of Nations. We discovered that Edith herself wanted Woodrow Wilson to compromise. She thought his failure to compromise would mar his place in history. But she urged him gently, and when he resisted, she didn't insist. She always did what he wanted. So they stayed in office until the end of his term in March of 1921. They left the White House. They settled here in Washington. He was the only president to have done that after leaving office. Three years later, he died. After his death, Edith had opportunity to run for office herself. She never took it. She was not interested in public office, in political power. She never proposed any new legislation or lobbied for any cause. She didn't even think women ought to have the vote. I began this project thinking that Edith was the pathbreaker 
the secret woman president. But I discovered that Ellen was the one who shaped history in her own way. She was the innovator. In her husband's administration, there was an assistant secretary to the Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. His wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, was a young wife who sometimes visited the White House and knew Ellen Wilson. After Ellen's death, no subsequent first lady lobbied for legislation until Eleanor Roosevelt entered the White House in March of 1933. During her first week there, she went up to Capitol Hill and began to lobby for an alley bill. As we all know, she lobbied for a lot of things in the next 12 years. And after her, most first ladies have felt they could and should have a cause of their own. This book festival was founded by Laura Bush, whose cause was libraries and literacy, arguably a direct connection between Ellen Wilson and where we are today. I also discovered that being close to a president may seem glamorous, but it's very tough. All three of the women involved with Woodrow Wilson paid a heavy price. But I think that Ellen realized this. She, of course, died in the White House. Mary Peck had wanted to go to the White House, but she wound up in a boarding house on the wrong side of the tracks. Edith had to nurse an invalid in the White House. But Ellen could have been speaking for all three of them. When she wrote Woodrow at the end of her life, this has been the most remarkable life history I ever even read about. And to think that I have lived it with you, I wonder if I am dreaming and will wake up and find myself married to a bank clerk. Thank you very much. So I think we have a few minutes if anyone would like to ask a question, sir. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to reading your book. Um, you. I've, I've probably read a couple of biographies of Woodrow Wilson and most recently went uh, to Staunton where he, his childhood home, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I saw a, a, a documentary about the women's party and the women's suffrage. And he let women be jailed for protesting at the White House. Uh, sure. Alice Paul led a number of people in prison on hunger strikes and he, he, he comes across uh, as a Southern gentleman who, in, who had racism and anti-sexism as part of his nature. Uh, so it's really surprising to hear that uh, he was as dependent on women as your book will demonstrate he was. Do you have any comments on uh, these weaknesses of his, I guess? Well, the first comment, thank you very much. That's a very, very good observation. Um, one of those is that uh, it was a sign of the times. Um, many women themselves did not approve of the vote. There were two branches of the women's suffrage movement. My grandmother was involved in the non-Alice Paul one. I discovered in the course of my research that she had been received at the White House because they were not picketing. They were trying to do it through political action. And he respected that, and he wanted to encourage that. Uh, I had not known that before I started researching the Woodrow Wilson papers in the White House log. Um, Edith was even more indignant than Woodrow. Woodrow used to invite the picketers into the house during cold weather for coffee. And when they refused to come in and be given coffee, 
Edith just had a fit. She just thought that was terribly rude of them to refuse his gentlemanly overtures. Of course, we can understand that that would have sort of undercut their point. Um, but it, it was certainly nothing that, uh, that I'm a big apologist for where Woodrow Wilson was concerned. Um, I, I certainly think the women in his life, particularly Ellen, um, were, were extremely admirable. Ellen herself was a great activist the, through her work for the alleyways. And she was recognized by the leading African-American newspaper at that time, the Washington Bee. After her death, they wrote and said, if only other white women could be as active as she is in trying to ameliorate the conditions uh, of the African-American community in Washington, we'd, we'd get ahead further. Um, but Woodrow Wilson was a Southerner. Everybody in his, you know, large number of the people in his cabinet were Southerners. It was, it was part of the culture of, of his time and his administration. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. It's not on? Yes. Um, thank you for writing this book. It's very interesting. And my question is, what happened to Edith after his death? Was there some sort of federal support or pension for her to care for her, or what happened? Good question. She lived for 38 more years. At the time she died in 1961, she was 89. Uh, and by the way, she died on Woodrow Wilson's birthday, which kind of gives me goosebumps. Um, but there was no definite policy about giving pensions to the widows of presidents. They had to be negotiated kind of on a year-by-year -year basis. I think eventually they were established, um, but in the beginning it was a little bit dicey. She, of course, had been quite wealthy before she married Woodrow. She had that flourishing jewelry store, and although that kind of took a hit during the Depression, and she did economize uh, from time to time. She did all right. She never had children, and she donated their house on S Street near DuPont Circle to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. It's a wonderful little museum, a little time capsule of life in the 1920s. So if you're interested in Woodrow Wilson, that's a great local place to visit. Thank you. Uh, do we have any indication as to what Ellen's illness was? Yes, she suffered from what was then called Bright's disease, which was kind of a catch-all phrase for kidney trouble. Uh, she had first been diagnosed with kidney trouble during her third pregnancy in 1889. But again, they didn't have a lot of medicine or treatment for that, and she probably would have succumbed to kidney disease in any case. Woodrow was extremely guilty about it. He felt that the pressure of the White House had done her in. But I think she, she always was going to get kidney disease. And um, that's what she died of. Hi. I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the uh, course of your research for this book. You mentioned the Library of Congress. And um, what, what documents you came across that were most important? If you uh, found, if you knew what you were looking for when you came in, or, or if you found things while in the course of your research that you didn't expect? Well, first I have to say I couldn't have done it without the help of my research associate, Robert H. McGinnis. Um, and also, the fabulous annotated collected letters uh, and papers of Woodrow Wilson, which were edited by Arthur Link and published by Princeton, 69 volumes of papers. The originals are in the Library of Congress on microfilm, um, but thanks to that wonderful annotated book, that's also a resource. But some of Ellen's papers are there, and Edith's papers, one of the most poignant that I've found uh, among Edith's, uh, among Ellen's papers were two notes that she wrote to Margaret, her oldest daughter, a few days before she died. And she said, the doctors say I'm going to get better, but I don't feel I'm going to get better. And she also said, my nights are so full of pain. They were just, you know, heart wringing to read those and to, to hold the papers that she wrote is also very magical. 
Um, and especially for Edith's papers, all of Edith's papers are there. Many of them were not collected because, of course, the Woodrow Wilson papers pretty much stop with his death, and she's got another 38 years. So the papers for the chapter on her life after Woodrow were very, very key there. And at the risk of sounding like an infomercial, I just have to have a big shout out to Jeff Flannery and all the people in the manuscript reading room because they're just wonderful. Anyone who wants to do research there will, will find a great team. First, I'd like to thank you for your tribute to these great women. I was wondering if you could talk about Ellen and Woodrow's three daughters, if any of them followed in their mother's footsteps with advocacy or supporting other great men, or what accomplishments they had of their own. Great question. Uh, the oldest daughter, Margaret, was a singer. Uh, accounts differ, but we felt at the end of the day that she probably didn't have a whole lot of talent and that people were nice to her because her father was president. I think this might have gradually dawned on her because eventually she went off and lived in an ashram in India, which is where she died. The second daughter, Jessie, married a lawyer, uh, Frank Sayer, and their son, became dean of the Washington Cathedral, a very beloved figure in Washington. And of course, Woodrow Wilson and Edith are buried at the cathedral. So there's that nice connection. The youngest daughter, known as Nell, married one of Woodrow Wilson's cabinet members, a man considerably older than she was, William Gibbs McAdoo. And they had children, and they were later divorced, and he married somebody even younger. Um, I would say the middle one was the closest to her mother. She had been active in the settlement house movement. She used to argue with Ellen about woman suffrage. J Jessie certainly felt that she, sh that women should have the vote. Ellen simply didn't want to come out and say something contrary to what her husband had said, but in one interview she said she thought at least working women should have the vote to protect themselves. I've just got a couple of minutes. You have one more question, madam? Yes. Thank you. I was intrigued by um, Edith's role after her husband had the stroke. Sounds like she was a surrogate president. Um, was there any debate at that time about um, Wilson being declared incompetent and the vice president um, taking over? And if you would care to speculate what that would have meant for our history? It's a big question in two minutes, <laughs> but it's a good one, and I'll, I'll do my best. Um, yes, she was deceptive, no two ways about it. There was a committee of two uh, senators who came to see what his condition was like, one Democrat and one Republican. And she and the doctor orchestrated the viewing of Woodrow to have him seen at his best advantage, completely hoodwinked these two senators who came away and told all the press that he was doing just fine, thank you, when he could hardly get out of bed. Um, so she, she definitely was duplicitous about that. Um, and um, Yes, I think it would have made a huge difference if she had not lied to the American people, basically, about his condition. She knew that he wanted to stay in office, and all she cared about was what he wanted. She was not thinking about the country, alas and alack. I mean, certainly if he had resigned, the vice president would have taken over, the vice president would have compromised, we would have joined the League of Nations. Then the question gets trickier. Would that have made a difference? Some people say, yes, if we joined the League of Nations, then there wouldn't have been World War II. There was a League of Nations. Of course, we weren't in it. But it did nothing to stop World War II. Um, in 1937, Bob found a great study that showed that 70 percent, a Gallup poll showed that 70 percent of the American people thought it had been a mistake to go into World War I. This was in 1937. We were a very isolationist country at that time. Even if we joined the League of Nations, it would have been with those amendments, which would have meant we wouldn't have had to do whatever the League of Nations determined. So 
I don't think at the end of the day it would have made any difference. But there are plenty of Wilson scholars, and some of them disagree with me. Uh, if you want the argument on the other side, I refer you to the wonderful biography by John Milton Cooper of Woodrow Wilson that came out a couple of years ago. And he's very eloquent for the other side. Thank you so much for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.